Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to the Luminous Program. I'm Father John Hibbert, pastor of Queen of the Most Holy Rosary Parish in Belleville, Ontario, part of the Archdiocese of Kingston in Canada. The topic I'd like to talk about today is about the Eucharist as sacrifice. Let us pray. Save us, O Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Pour out your Spirit upon your people and grant that we may always celebrate the memorial of your death and resurrection so that we may come to experience the gift of salvation you have given to your people. Look upon us as your holy church and constantly transform us so that we may become your image to all the world, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. But rather than read from scripture, I'd like to read from the third Eucharistic prayer. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. And after the consecration, we read, Therefore, o Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. Sacrifice is an important part of life. When we love someone, we want to give them a gift, a personal gift, and that gift expresses the depth of our love. I often think of Valentine's Day. Imagine a husband who forgets all about it. And so in the last moment, he walks up to his wife and he says, I love you. Well, I'm sure that that's a heartfelt expression, but I would suspect that she's ex thinking of a little bit more than just words. She's expecting some type of gift, some type of token, of her husband's love, deep love and appreciation. And so gift giving is something that is important. And the emphasis I think has to be on giving. We live in a very self-centered world in which people are always talking about what's in it for me. That means that the Eucharist that we celebrate is very counter-cultural. It is not about what we get. How often do I hear people say, oh, I don't go to Mass anymore because I don't get anything out of it. Well, no wonder. It's not about what you get. It's about what you give. It's about what you bring. That's the most important thing. I think the mystery of Jesus has reminded us that it's only in giving that we receive. The person who loses his life will save it. But the person who's out to save their life is always wanting to know what's in it for me, is a person I think that's going to end up awfully empty and unself-satisfied. And so giving implies a loss, a loss for us and a gain for the other person. But it's the happiness of the other person that makes us happy as well. And so that is the mystery that we celebrate in the Eucharist. So as Jesus reminds us over and over again, to lose one's life is to gain it. The Eucharist tells us that we do not go through life without loss. That old expression, no pain, 
no gain. But you know, I think if we reflect on our lives, we might recognize that it's only in time of challenge, in time of pain, that we really grow as human beings. You know, if all of life was perfect happiness, I don't think we'd invent everything, anything. We wouldn't change anything. Why? Because we're perfectly happy. But suddenly there's a challenge. Suddenly there's something that looks like it's insurmountable placed before us. That's when we human beings rise to the occasion with the gifts that God has given to us. And it's those challenges that make us grow, that make us develop as human beings. I don't think there's any family that has not felt pain, loss, or challenges. Whether it's losing a job, or the saddest of all things, losing a child. All the losses that we experience can become opportunities for us to grow. And so as we seek to grow in the love of Jesus and leave behind that old person, yes, it's painful, but the pain brings growth. And that's really what we celebrate in the Eucharist. The prayer that I just read from the Eucharistic prayer number three reminds us of the role of the Holy Spirit in transforming the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. And that is a wonderful mystery and a wonderful miracle. But it's not the end of the story as we celebrate the Eucharist, because then after the consecration, we pray that that same Holy Spirit will work another transformation, the transformation of each one of us. And what do we want to become? We want to become one body and one spirit in Christ. That is what we are called to be. And it's only the work of the Holy Spirit that can really do that and bring about that transformation. And so there's two invocations of the Holy Spirit, one to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus, the other to gradually transform us into the body of Jesus as well. The miracle for the Holy Spirit is a lot easier to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ than it is for that Spirit to change us into the body of Christ. The bread and wine puts up no resistance, does not have a will. We do. And while we may not be conscious of it, sometimes we put up a lot of resistance to the will of God and to the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit has a tremendous job to do with us. And perhaps that's why it takes our whole lifetime for that Holy Spirit to work with us. And that's why we just don't celebrate the Eucharist once in our lifetime. We have to keep coming back over and over again. And so we come before God in the altar and we say, God, here am I. I want to make my life a sacrifice. And just as the bread and wine are brought to the altar and symbolize us, because the prayer that the priest says reminds us that the bread and wine are the work of human hands. And so the bread and the wine symbolize us. The very fact that bread is made from many grains and wine is made from many grapes reminds us that we are each a grain. We are each a grape. And what the Holy Spirit has to do is to grind us as wheat in order to form the flour to become the Eucharist. And the same Holy Spirit has to crush us as grapes in order that we may become the wine that is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And so the very symbolism of the bread and wine is us. And we place ourselves on the altar to offer ourselves to God. Now our offering is not complete but it's sincere. We say, God, here I am. I have come to do your will. And we mean it. And so one of my professors once said, the most dangerous thing you can do in the world is to celebrate the Eucharist. Because if you really mean what you say, you are giving yourself entirely to God. You are sacrificing yourself to him. But I know for me, and you know, that once we leave church all through the week, I think we take back a little of ourselves over and over and over. And that's why we have to come back. And we need to renew that offering, renew that gift of dedication. 
we have the Holy Spirit renew us, that we sincerely want to give ourselves to Christ and to the world in service. And so, yes, the Eucharist is a sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, as painful as that was, it proved that he was going to remain faithful to God and that he would even accept death rather than betray the task that God gave to him. We must do the same as well. And our suffering is nothing compared to his. And our suffering, in one sense, is stretched over a longer period of time. And so are we sincere in sharing the suffering of Christ in order that we may offer ourselves to God? But we know, most likely, we're not going to die in church on Sunday. We're going to go home and we're going to resume a different life. But what we are giving to God is a different sacrifice. And so you will hear in some of the prayers of the Mass that we come to give a sacrifice of praise. You know, when God created us, we are told that he breathed into us his very life, his very spirit, that Ruha. And when we come to church, we use that very breath that is deep within us to voice our thanksgiving and to voice our praise to God. In a sense, we're returning the same spirit that he's given to us. We are once again sacrificing the life that he gave to us. But the sacrifice of praise in church needs to be symbolic of our whole life. That's why we need to pray at home in every place. Prayer in church on Sunday is a wonderful thing, but it has to be built on a foundation. It has to be built on something solid. And that is a whole life of prayer, that we're giving thanks to God all the time, not just on Thanksgiving, but every day. And you know, if we stop and think about our life at the end of the day, yes, we've overcome some tragedies, we've experienced some pain, some setbacks, but how are we able to see the hand of God that is present there as well? And can we give thanks for that? But not only for the good things. You may recall in the Acts of the Apostles, at one time Peter was put into jail, and another time Paul and his apostles. And we are told in the Acts of the Apostles that they sang the praises of God for the privilege of sharing in suffering. That's probably something unique that we don't do all the time, to thank God even in our sufferings for all that he has given to us. Because as I said, when we suffer, we grow. That's when our human spirit is expanded. Now, we just can't do that on our own power. That's where we also need the Holy Spirit as well to give us that courage, but also to give us the insight and to give us the ability to see the hand of God that is in our lives as well. And so let us gather when we celebrate the Eucharist to give thanks to God, to offer our life and to offer our praise, to be one with him. And when we receive the Eucharist and we return to our seat, as we give thanks for that great gift, let us also remember that part of our prayer of thanksgiving is also to ask the Holy Spirit to continue to work that transformation within us. When you listen to the prayer after communion, it's really not a prayer of thanksgiving. It's always, most times, a prayer asking for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, that what we have received in holy mystery, we may live in our lives. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, transform our hearts and our minds that we may accept the will of God for our lives. But above all, that we may become more and more like Christ. Grant that as you unite us as God's holy people, giving us a great witness to all the world through love, so we may become a holy people, a holy people who are able to reflect your power to all the world. And may Jesus, who loves us and who renews us in the Eucharist, always bring about that transformation. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. and grateful to welcome and encourage Shalom Ministries in the Diocese. I see your work as being truly prophetic in bringing more and more people 
to friendship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, I want to bless you and all the people of Shalom and all those who are coming to know Christ through your ministry. So I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God be with you always.